Uh, Hi, this is Malcolm McDowell. You're watching without your head. I mean, head as in what kind of head are we talk? This one. Yeah. Oh, this one. Okay, right, right. so it's clear. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the Station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neal, and I'm joined by legendary screenwriter and filmmaker Paul Schrader. It's very cool to have you here. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Well, what's interesting is uh, it's the 40th anniversary of Cat People. And so when your Cat People was, uh, was originally released, it was the 40th anniversary of the original Cat People. Ah, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, so it's weird to think that uh, a movie from the, the 40s was as old then as a movie from the 80s is today. Yeah, well, that, that uh, you know, is it, very, very true of uh, things in general because, I mean, I remember when I was editing a film magazine and we got in touch with Joseph H. Lewis about uh, doing an article about him. And he said, who sees those old movies anyway? Now, he was talking about movies that were 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and now, you know, we're dealing with movies that are 50 years old that uh, are as viewable as they were, or more viewable than they were when they came out. Yeah, it's, it's very, because uh, the movie from the 80s doesn't seem like a, like a dated movie to me, but a movie from the 40s, uh, obviously that's 80 years ago now, but uh, it seems so much uh, like a totally different time. I mean, when I was in college, Casablanca was considered, you know, like an old movie, and Casablanca was 42, and that was 68, so that, so that you know, wasn't that far back. Yeah. So, uh, Cat People, that's the first movie that you directed that you didn't write. So, I wrote uh, uh, Blue Collar and Hardcore. Oh, right. yeah, and the first one, yeah. Yes. So, how did that come about? How did it come about that uh, you'd be involved with Cat People? Well, um, in the war, uh, Universal offered it to me. And. Um, because American Gigolo had done well. And uh, I thought it'd be fun to do something uh, not so uh, not so personal, you know? Mm -hmm. To do a genre piece. In the Why end, is it? Of course, uh, in the end, I think it is um, uh, as personal or more personal than the others. Hmm. How so? But that, that was my original inclination was to say, "Oh, okay, I'll just do this this horror genre piece and uh, and I get off from uh, the self examination pedestal." Right. So how how does that how does that change? And you go in thinking, you know, I'm just going to make a genre movie. It's not going to be uh, personal to me, and then it becomes personal. Is that something you can't help? You just you know add that to the movie. Well, th that part of it, but also. Uh, that I uh, became besotted with uh, nostalgia, and um, and that kind of took over my life. And um, the film started becoming about about that, and um, and in fact uh, that sort of precipitated the end of my Hollywood years, uh, just because the complications of that romance. And uh, subsequent and uh, kind of, uh, coinciding uh, drug use, that it was just time to leave Hollywood, and I did. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm a 
huge fan of taxi driver. I mean, of cab people. But um, you know, I do see it as uh, the end of a chapter. Mm-hmm. So, how has your views of it changed over the years? Uh, do you look at it differently now than you did when it first came out? Uh, no, I, I, I've always liked it. Uh, I was uh, always kind of put off by those. You know, there's always a collection of people who are going to say not as good as the original. Mm-hmm. And that's just, you know, that's just human nature. Uh, they're doing it now with Nightmare Alley. I mean, this version of Nightmare Alley is so much better than the golden one. It's so much better. But, you know, there are going to be people who say, oh, it wasn't as good as the original. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I find at the time uh, that it came out, because I was dealing with that comparison, I said, you know, we should have just renamed it something else. And because it, we changed it so much, the only reason it still it gets compared to Cap People is because we kept the name and also because we kept a, a series of um, uh, homage scenes, you know, to the original. And we, those were put in intentionally, not because they were particularly good for the story. You know, like like the streetcar and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I, I was always irritated by that kind of knee-jerk film buff reaction of, oh, it's not as good as the original, not as good as the original. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's even... I mean, it's, it's technically comparable, but I don't think it's at all similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, similar, uh, just, just similar themes. Yeah. And uh, and uh, and as I said, the same, I feel the same way about the Nightmare Alley thing. So, what has happened, I guess, but that that hurt the film when it came out. Uh, that comparison, and now that comparison has wilted away, and and. Uh, I've had very good fortune with uh, quite a few films having good shelf life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, some films, you know, they seem to be so uh, so hot, and then, you know, 10 years later, you know, well, but what was Green Book? There was a movie called Green Book. Right, yeah, one you know? best movie, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and other movies just you know, hang around and people keep refinding them and that and they have shelf life. Mm-hmm. So I think that's, I mean, uh, cat people, I keep saying taxi driver, uh, cat people have picked up uh, shelf life. And uh, also, part of it, it was a little outre at the time. You know, I, I ended, I changed the ending. And the original ending was, kind of a genre ending where there was a big old house. The monster was trapped inside the house. They set fire to the house and the house, the monster died in the house. Mm-hmm. Monster being the cat. Right. And, uh, and I just thought that was so hokey. And <laughs> I was saying, you know, I gotta, how about this? How about he be captures the monster has sex with it? And then keeps it in a shrine so he can visit it. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, oh, that is that is a much better ending. That is a really cool ending. So then I ended up with this kind of um, bonded scene where he's trapping John is trapping Nastasia naked to a bed so that she won't kill him when she transforms. And then, uh, and David Bowie is, you know, singing all of this uh, quasi-religious mumbo jumbo, <laughs> uh-huh. Ooh, you know, and it's it's like some, uh, well, it's meant to be like some uh, primal sacrificial ceremony. Yeah, and that really works uh, with the beginning of the movie because then you have it bookended with with both the sacrifices. And, yeah, but and, I do remember. I, I remember quite vividly that uh, you know we didn't do that much previewing back then, and uh, 
Jerry Bruckheimer was the producer, and Jerry and I went on uh, opening night to the uh, Avco on Westwood in, in Los Angeles. And we were sitting way in the back, and uh, in front of us there were a couple young girls, I would say maybe 17 or so. And it came to the ending. And when he starts tying her to the bed, and I do those those sort of um, fetishistic um, close-ups. Mm -hmm. And the one girl turned to the other and just went, oh, my God. <laughs> I leaned up to Jerry, and I said, you know, Jerry, I think maybe we went a little too far. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you have any issues with the MPA uh, releasing the movie with any of the sex scenes or nudity? No, it was... Uh, uh, it was a a, um, a little different then. I mean, sex was selling. Well, we, sex doesn't sell anymore. Nobody. But that was one the days when people would go to the movies to see uh, famous people naked. We don't do that anymore, and uh, because we've got the internet. <laughs> um, and so uh, it, that, it was accepted as part of the rating system mm -hmm. that you know. Sex was part of uh, uh, the commercial package of a film, and it's just a matter of how much sex you had, you know. And there were sort of guidelines. It was, you know, it would have these ludicrous guidelines like three, three thrusts is acceptable, four <laughs> is unacceptable. Right, right. And then it would literally get that that picky and. Uh, uh, but uh, no, we didn't have any problem uh, with that. No. Mm -hmm. it was interesting. I watch it again for the interview. I've seen it many times before. But uh, you know, everyone's talked about the sexuality of the movie, obviously. But also, what I think's interesting is uh, when you say the monster for for the monster for the cat to become human again, it has to kill. So it's almost you know has sex to become an animal, but then uh, to go back to being human, it's almost like to be human, you have to kill. And I think that's yeah. kind of a statement yeah. about humanity. <laughs> and, uh, um, and uh, of course, uh, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, it, uh, one of the interesting things is, you know, it's, it's, so it's a pretty digital film. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was a period there where I kind of winced at it because, you know, it could be done so much better with later technology but now i kind of like the fact that it is og and that uh, because if you would do that now and i'm sure it will be done again because it's an evergreen uh you know with all the sophistication of digitized animals it probably could become less fun because it becomes too too easy too slick Mm -hmm. You know, to uh, the fact that you know that it's being faked, you know, with, with, with you know, with various devices, um, practical devices, you know, uh, has kind of uh, uh, I, I find it kind of comforting to see uh, old school horror in the era of all digital green screen horror. Oh, I agree 100%. That's something we talked about on the show, because I think um, with CG, there's always something about the weight not being there, and even, like, you can just tell it's not exactly there. And I always think even kind of bad practical effects have a charm to it, where a bad CG just looks bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, in, in a strange way, it's kind of... Uh, humanizing because uh, you know that that you know there's actually actors under all that makeup trying to make this work. Right. Yeah. There's a charm to that. Um. How about just the the difficulties of uh, filming a leopard? Uh. Well, uh, they are nocturnal and arboreal. <laughs> okay. So there's a so there's a lot of difficulties, uh, and they are not 
in any way uh, trainable. Mm -hmm. So I had a uh, couple black leopards, one of whom was crazy and had to be put down. You see him, in fact, uh, die in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, he chopped. The, the, the cages had it were real cages, really secure cages, because these are dangerous animals. And he carved straight at the camera and, and split open to his forehead. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a black leopard. Um, and, uh, and, but for the, the stuff outside, we used uh, mountain lions dyed black. Oh, really? Yeah, so th because those you can kind of, they're, they're, they're not nocturnal, they're not arboreal. You, you know, you, you can sort of, you know, uh, uh, get them to do certain things in a limited way, whereas you do everything that I dealt with the, with the big, the real big cats had to be hyper secure. And I, 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 uh, I once asked one of the trainers, I said, uh, uh, how will I know if something's going wrong? And he said, you'll see me running. <laughs> That's very comforting. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, uh, but the, the, the cat at the very end, that's a leopard. The cat in the cave at the beginning, that's a leopard. Uh, the uh, there's a couple of other levers that we were able to use, but once we got into uh, you know, hitting marks and stuff like that, you couldn't use a real lever, yeah. So, um, how about casting the movie? Because you, you know, I was saying sex cells and Natasha Kinski obviously looks great, uh, but you also have to have an innocence of the character because she's a virgin in the movie, not, not to spoil a 40 year old movie. So, was that a hard role to uh, cast? Well, I mean, you know, she was so beautiful. I mean, I, I, I remember saying to the photographer that uh, uh, we don't even uh, somebody's trying to interrupt. I'm going to. No. So, um, hello, are you still there? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I said the cinematographer, yeah, I said, you know, we don't have to put any light in these things. Just have Nastasia there. She lights it herself. I mean, that's how besotted I was. But, but it is true. She is just at that moment kind of incandescent. And, um, and, uh, and I thought that my uh, job as director was somehow you know I, I, I this is why I got in trouble because I've got this notion that if if I if she was full of the if she was full of the love I felt for her that love would go immediately onto the screen and the audience would feel it too now there's some truth in that but there's also some some crazy delusion in it too mm -hmm. so, are you I, I think most go on sorry and like I say, but most men have been there. Mm -hmm. You said this is why you got in trouble. Um, was there something with you and Natasha while you're filming this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I had been living with someone. I was going to get married, and then uh, I started having an uh, affair with uh, Natasha. And then I, I broke it off, and uh, I got my girlfriend wife to be to forgive me and then i uh and then i'm in the middle of editing the film and the phone rings at this massage and she says i'm in paris i miss you will you come over so i went right to the airport and so i knew <laughs> i knew that there was no forgiveness after that <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you, you talked earlier about, you know, this is kind of like how you left Hollywood. So um, w what was the point where you're like, I just have to, was there a point like, I, I need to get out of this? Or were you kind of forced out? Or was it like a decision, I, you know, I have to get out of here for my own uh, sanity? 
very buggy time. And, uh, and everybody I knew, you know, w- w- was fighting it in some way. Uh, some were dying like John, you know, some were going to the hospital like Marty. But it was very much of the moment. Because uh, there was a period there where people thought that cocaine was not addictive, and uh, but it is and just in a different way. You know, it destroyed Sam Peckinpah, and a lot of people were getting wiped out by it. And uh, and when that romantic thing came, when the wheels came off that wagon, the drug that I had been taking started taking me, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and then, uh, and then all of the dark fantasies come up, and one day you say, "If I don't leave this world, I mean, me, this town, I'm not going to make it out of here. Mm-hmm. I got to go." And uh, and uh, and so I just I, I moved to New York, and uh, I thought I'd start all over again. And I moved to New York, and lo and behold. Uh, I, uh, I was going to get rid of all my drug friends, and lo and behold, I, I had met new drug friends. I didn't know they had drug friends in New York. So then I moved to Japan, and then finally uh, put an end to that uh, that period. So I, I was. It's, it's not. Um, it takes a while. Anybody who's uh, been an act knows that it's not something that you do over a period of months it's a period you do over something that happens over a period of years mm-hmm. yeah i'm i'm not comparing but i've been 30 months uh sober uh uh coming up so i understand i understand on some oh, level. I, I i actually quit drinking myself i'm about four months five months sober no oh, very good this yeah. uh um, obviously you've made tons of things since then, but, um, when you, when you first get off drugs at that time, um, did you think that would hurt your creativity at all? Oh, I did. I did. And it did. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, I used to write at night and I would start at 10 PM and then it was, um, caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, cocaine, Round and round you go until it's six in the morning, and you've done about ten or fifteen pages of work. And uh, but then uh, I got married, and I had a children, and I realized I had to quit the night shift. And the the last use I had for all that substance abuse was writing. I I taken it out of all my social life, Mm -hmm. but I still used it to write. And then it took me almost a year to learn how to write in the daytime. Ever since college, I had been addicted to the, uh, the night shift. Mm. And the night shift was based on abuse. It was based on cigarettes and booze and, and uh, so forth, you know. Yeah. And uh, stuff you can't do all day long. Mm-hmm. And so it took a year, a little less, of having an office and going in there every day and just you know, so trying to write, trying to write, and uh, eventually I figured out how to write during the daytime. Mm-hmm. Weirdly, you were like the you were like the leopard. You were nocturnal. Yeah. Well, uh, yes. I mean, it was that was one of the great seductions of uh, writing and and of uh, substance abuse is that you know the the world goes to sleep and. And everybody is silent, and and you ply your uh, typewriter with substances, and and out come these little people, and they start to play, and you know that if you don't give them something to drink, they're not going to come out. Mm-hmm. And so you say, okay, everybody's in bed now. You you can come out. So, um, how did how was the movie received when it first came out? Um, I think that um, Universal was disappointed. I think that they had uh, greater expectations for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, uh, you know, a, a combination of 
you know, the, 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 the snob thing of saying it's not as good as, as the original and then there's an uncomfortability about it that um, just like those two girls are sitting ahead of Bruckheimer and I, you know, who are in many ways the target audience. And all of a sudden you saw them go white. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, it's a problem I've had uh, over the years. Penny Marshall, who is a, old, a good friend of mine, you know, said, your problem, Paul, is that you know exactly where the line is, and you go right up to the edge, and then you step over it. <laughs> Penny, of course, never ste stepped over a line in her life. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So um, how about the, the transformation scene? Um, how did you get to that? You know, was there a thought like, how are we going to transform her into the cat? Because uh, it's a lot different than I kind of compare it to a werewolf movie. And she, you know, just busts out of her out of the human. Yeah, I mean, obviously, werewolf was also universal right at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about uh, the same mold makers and uh, Berman, Tom Berman and... Uh, so Universal, in fact, had a, a kind of in-house team, uh, uh, just like they did in the old horror days. So a lot of that technology was there, and uh, and it was just a matter of you know how to do it, and it's you know very time-consuming, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know it's. Uh, but uh, you know, we did it as 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 best we could. No, I think it looks cool. And, uh, how did you get David Bowie involved? Well, I had done uh, uh, the film before I'd done with Giorgio Moroder, and I was doing this one with Giorgio. And Giorgio had brought in um, Blondie mm -hmm. for American Gigolo. He had a big hit with that. And then he was saying, um, I'm talking about the, the music for this, and he said, you know, Bowie would be great for this. And uh, he, at that time, was literally their hitmeister. You know, he had, he, he, he had all those disco hits, one after another. Mm -hmm. So you know, Giorgio calls you up and say, I've got a song I've written I'd like you to do. Hello, uh, you know. David says, "You yeah, well, come over to Montreux. We'll do it." No, so no. It's, not, it's not me calling. It's not me calling David. It's Georgia calling David. Yeah, yeah. But what what did you? Uh, how much do you have any input on? Like the actual song he does, or what do you think of it when you hear it? Um, no, not a lot. I mean, I said I wanted to have a two part thing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hook it to the piece frame. So I wanted to start out kind of soulful. Then when the uh, when you have that freeze frame effect and he growls, then I said then we can turn it into a dance song. Mm -hmm. So that was all I uh, in terms of lyrics and any of that stuff, that was all David. Just the idea of having a lead up and then it bursts into a dance song. Yeah. You know, uh, he did it on, like, on the words with gasoline. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And yeah. Then it takes it. Yeah. Did, did, you, uh, did you like the song when you first heard it? Do you think it fit the movie? Oh, yeah. yeah I loved it. Yeah. And, and, and then it was a question of the song was so good, you know, and, and you know, Tarantino sort of uh, attacked me some years ago saying when he put the song in his film, he said, it's such a great song, why did Shader stick it at the end? And I knew it was a great song, and I knew it could have been a hit, but I had so planned to do the opening as the primitive religious ceremony mm -hmm. that had dance melody at the front i just couldn't get my head around it yeah it does and, it wouldn't uh, fit the beginning yeah and uh, but uh, 
I didn't. I knew that uh, the song would have been even bigger if it had been up front. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, I mean, like you said, you, it just wouldn't fit. I love the beginning, by the way. Uh, the stylized lights, the red, the reds, and uh, where was that film with the tree and the and the and the uh, panther or the? That was uh, on the stage at Universal. Oh. Uh, the, I'm in New Orleans now. We shot the, uh, well, half the film here in New Orleans. And then the rest we saw, shot on stage at Universal City. Okay. And, uh, you're not you know, known for, as a horror guy, but are, are you a horror movie fan at all? Um, I am, but I don't. My feeling about a lot of these things is I've seen one of them. I saw a Spider-Man. I don't need to see any more. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I love to see, you know, like, a zombie movie. You know, it's really cool if it's well-made. But I'm not going to watch a zombie TV series. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> Just, uh, and uh, so I... You know, that's what I guess separates me from the the real, the real uh, fans is that they just watch anything and they watch. Well, I had one of my kids that just watch it over and over and over again. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm a fan. I, I kind of agree with you with the zombie thing. Uh, if if you do, if you have a new take on zombies, it's cool. But I've seen. Basically, every zombie movie is a take on a Romero zombie, and I don't need to see that over and over. You know, I told, I was just talking to who wants to do a zombie movie, but he's been, been trying to do it, and it'll be set in uh, Central America in the political world, and that's Pablo Lorraine. Oh, interesting. You know, he did uh, Spencer, the last one, and... Uh, and Jackie, you know, yeah. I was just talking to him. He's a very talented guy. He says, I've been trying to do a zombie movie, but uh, I, there's a zombie movie I can see. Yeah. yeah, I would I would suggest Train to Busan was a recent zombie movie. It's a Korean zombie movie, and it's a, it's a lot different than uh, a big difference to me is it's Korean. So there's no guns in it. So um, typically in all American movies, everyone's shooting everybody, especially in zombie movies. So. It's a, how, how do they uh, deal with this without, you know, being able to shoot it in the head, but it's an interesting movie. Um, before I let you go, I do want to say, uh, I love card counter. I go, I'm not just a horror movie guy. I love all movies. And I saw card counter at the theater and I thought it was great, but a uh, big question about that. Is that a hard movie to, um, to like make a trailer for? Because people think it's about gambling, but it really is just on the surface about gambling and you don't want to give away really what the movie's about. So is it, was that just yeah. a hard movie to market? Well, it, um, I mean, that's sort of the, the game it plays. And, um, and, uh, I, obviously I, I want people to think, Oh, it's a cool gambling movie, gambling yeah. movie. And then, and then the whole, I, I get my hooks in, and, and you realize I, I I couldn't care less about who wins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you, not to spoil it, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, but then that's something I've been doing my whole life is finding uh, original metaphor for something that you think you know, like you know, a taxi driver in movies was always the best friend. He was the funny guy, sat mm-hmm. in the front seat, told you. And when I first came upon him, which was my first script, I looked at him and I didn't see that. I saw the black heart of existentialism. I saw a loneliness and I saw somebody trapped in a metal box going crazy. Mm-hmm. And so then you can make that metaphor come all alive because people haven't made that association. People haven't associated poker play with torture. Mm-hmm. You know, or in the case of First Reform, associated uh, uh, spiritual crisis with environmental collapse, or light sleeper midlife crisis with drug dealing. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I know. I'm so sure that, people tell you this all the time, but Taxi Driver is my favorite movie, and so it's uh, yeah. been very cool to have you here. But a uh, card counter is I great do. too. I do want to. Um, also, uh, I like to go into a movie if possible. It's always possible, not really knowing anything about it. And so I went into Card Counter not knowing anything about it, and so it really sucked me in, and uh, I loved it. Yeah, right. yeah, and at some point. You know, he said, wait, this is not about gambling. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I was like, I honestly didn't even know uh, you may, I went in and I was like, oh, I'll watch this. It's probably about gambling. And it comes up, uh, Paul Schrader and produced by Martin Scorsese. I was like, oh, wow, this, I, I'm, I'm uh, happy I went to see this. And yeah, it was, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Thank you. You're very welcome. And um, I know you're a busy guy. Do you, uh, do you have anything? I know you're, I think you're about to work on something. Yeah, I'm in New Orleans now doing pre-production, and we started about three weeks. Uh, this is a film with Joel Edgerton and Sigourney Weaver and a young black actress who I'm, I'm very high on. And uh, this is, again, one of these metaphors, you know, only this time he's not a poker player, he's a gardener, he's a horticulturalist. Mm. And... Uh, so, and uh, it's uh, some people have said to me that it was the third one of the trilogy was first informed and Clark's art. And uh, I objected to that, and now I'm starting to realize that maybe it's true. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And um, really uh, appreciate coming on and talk about cat people for the 40th anniversary. Uh, I forgot to mention Malcolm McDowell is amazing in it. And uh, if you have any quick stories about Malcolm McDowell. Uh, well, just Malk was, uh, uh, I mean, but, 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 okay. We, we, we were talking about drugs earlier. Yeah. So I leave Los Angeles. Now I'm in New York. I run into John Hurd on the street. And uh, John says, you know, have you ever taken a crack? I said, no, 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 I haven't done it. He said, oh, this is the greatest thing. It's the greatest thing. I'll take it. I'll take it. I said, okay, okay. So I think, and I just had the worst experience forever, forever. I just fell into a pit. I just thought I was going to die. But God, I'm never going to do that again. Then I run into Malcolm McDowell two weeks later. And Malcolm says, hey, Jerry, have you ever tried crack? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I I tried it with John, and it was just like the worst thing ever. He said, oh, you must have had a bad experience. You got to try it again. <laughs> so I tried it again, and it was just as bad the second time. <laughs> so I, I, I dodged that bullet. Well, very good. <laughs> so that's a good message that, for everyone. Stay off the crack. Yeah. I don't suppose that's the kind of Malcolm McDowell story you wanted to hear. <laughs> it's, it's one I've not heard before, so that's very good. <laughs> but yeah, I'm a big fan of Malcolm McDowell. I interviewed him once and I told him uh, I used to watch a lot of his movies with my mom and he just looked at me and he said, no wonder you're so fucked up. But that's my Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate this. It's been very fun to talk with you. All right, Neil. Take care. You as well. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>